Hello, beloveds, and welcome to Christian Emotional Recovery, a podcast for those who are survivors of childhood trauma, emotional neglect, and narcissistic abuse. This podcast is hosted by Rachel Leroy, a college professor and trauma survivor. Many of us spend years trying to heal and don't get anywhere. We don't always target the trauma itself, which is so often what keeps us stuck. This podcast is where faith meets science. Rachel is an emotional healing expert with 20 years of experience applying healing modalities that helped her start making progress after nothing else worked. She'll show you how to do the same. Each week, we'll cover a topic that will show you how to heal trauma for good. Please check out our website and show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com and join the Facebook community, Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 5 of Christian Emotional Recovery. I'm your host, Rachel Leroy, and I want to thank you for tuning in and listening today. And today's episode is going to be Subtle Types and Forms of Abuse and What to Do About Them. That's Season 4, Episode 5, Subtle Types and Forms of Abuse and What to Do About Them. I think this is an important topic to talk about because there's a lot of people that don't even know if they were abused and they question themselves. And a lot of times abusers, either by design or unintentionally, unconsciously I should say, will actually try to convince the person that what they're being, how they're being treated is normal. And if they've been immersed in that their whole life, they won't know any different. For example, if you have a family system and that is the norm, then you will not question that even if you're around other people because it's so ingrained into your mind that you don't have a reason to question it. And I'm going to share my experience with this a little bit too. I've shared a little bit in the past. I don't get explicit about it, but I will share some of my experiences well to explain how that works. And there's also some examples in the resources that give people's experiences that will clarify. So you can see if you're in this situation and what you can do about it and how you can heal. But first, let's um, talk about the platform. If you have not, um, you're more than welcome to join the Facebook group. The Facebook group is Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Um, People post encouragement there. They ask questions. They get support. While we can't be a crisis uh, intervention. We can help you by talking you through certain situations you may be in where you're confused or you just need moral support or validation. We don't encourage people to just go in circles. This is a healing group. So we you are free to share your pain with us. Your pain will be validated, but for the purpose of healing, for the purpose of moving forward. And sometimes that might mean you need to sit in that pain. And that's normal too, and that's okay. But I'm just, I just wanted to give some clarifications of the boundaries of the group as well. Self-promotion is not allowed, and um, spam posting is also not allowed. So spam posting can be if somebody wants to post three times a day, for example. You are more than welcome to post, but don't post. Just keep the post reasonable. I have had to reject posts when people just kept posting and posting and posting. Or maybe they were posting something about their podcast that's similar to mine, which I love to support similar and other creators, and I'm all for that. And I welcome it in my group to a point, but the group there is more to support people that are already in this group as well. So some cross, you know, um, promotion is fine, but let's just keep it reasonable, okay? So I don't want to get bogged down in that. Also check out the group, like I said, the YouTube channel, which has material that you cannot find on the podcast. It's exclusive to the YouTube channel. It's also called Christian Emotional Recovery. All the links to this are in the show notes. And also check out, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to Patreon and sign up to 
um, support monthly. Your support is greatly appreciated. Or you can do a one-time donation at ko-fi.com. That's K-O-F-I.com. Both reputable resources. You can do research and find out that they are reputable. And so those are some ways that you can support the podcast, which I greatly appreciate. And I thank you so much if you are already supporting the podcast. Every little bit helps because it does take time and it does take resources, as I say, every week. And I just say that to encourage people to support if you can't. If you can't, then I'm here for you. And the whole point of this podcast is to have a free resource that can help people. But I do want to start building some paid subscriptions and paid resources in the near future as the podcast and the platform continue to grow. It's a slow growth. So we're just going at the natural pace that God allows and God enables me to do. Okay. And lastly, if you'd like to sign up to get email um, notifications and updates on the platform, you can go to rachelleroy.com, rachelleroy.com, and christianemotionalrecovery.com, christianemotionalrecovery.com, also in the show notes, and you can go there and there are ways you can sign up for the email list and get a re- free resource as well. So check that out. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So today we're talking about subtle types and forms of abuse and what to do about them. And this talk is one where you really need to dig in a little bit. And I like using research so that it's based in reality and it's based in something grounded and something that is provable. And so, because this is something where perception and reality can get tangled and I'm never going to gaslight anybody. I'm never going to say what happened to you did not happen or you're imagining it or you're exaggerating it. But If we go too far the other way, it is possible to start thinking every little shortcoming that somebody does in a relationship is abuse. It's not. We're all human. We all make mistakes. We all need to show each other grace. We also need to have a growth mindset, which means that we need to be looking towards ways to heal, towards ways to validate our pain, and to realize that other people may be in a similar boat to us. So showing grace does not mean you're tolerating abuse, but there is a line and there are boundaries that you need to set. And finding that subtle gray area can be tricky and it might be a little different for everybody. And yours might shift one way or the other as you... Um, evolve. So just keep that in mind. But finding that balance where you're not thinking every little thing is abuse and also where you're not gaslighting yourself and denying something that is abuse, those are the balances that we're trying to find here. So in this podcast, we're going to talk about identifying subtle forms and types of abuse and what to do about them. And then we're going to talk about what are subtle forms of and signs of abuse. And we'll go over some different types of subtle abuse, like verbal abuse, behaviors that indicate abuse, and more behaviors. Then we'll talk about what are subtle forms of abuse, like why are they easy to miss? That's the biggest one. That's the most important one. So why are subtle forms of abuse easy to miss? Why do we question ourselves? Why do we doubt ourselves? Why do we not believe it happened? Why do we not believe it was as bad as we thought it was? Those are some things that we'll talk about as well. Then we'll talk about how misinformation in the church and in religion communities can often make this worse and keep people brainwashed and in abusive situations. Now, I'm not trying to bash the church in general. Every church is different. There's the greater church, which is the body of Christ, which might include Methodists and um, unaffiliated people, non-denominational people, Catholics, Baptists, Pentecostals. You get the idea. Uh, Lutherans, Episcopalians. But what I'm talking about is specific churches here. Okay, so I'm not attacking the whole body of Christ. But there is a mentality, especially one that's growing in American culture, where people are trying to pull things back. And it creates a fertile, it creates a fertile environment for abuse, if that makes sense. We'll talk about that if you're wondering what the heck I'm talking about. We'll talk about that in a little bit if you're wondering what the heck I'm talking about. You might hear my cat in the background. She meows when she plays. It's hilarious. And then we'll talk about how can we detect subtle forms of emotional abuse? How do we detect them? And how we avoid getting out of balance the other way. And then lastly, we'll talk about what are ways we can heal these unique types and manifestations of abuse. How can we heal those? How do we move forward? How do we deal with those so that we don't gaslight ourselves? 
so to speak. Okay, so um, as always, I used a lot of research. Not all, as always, but in this one, I did use a lot of research. So as always, the resources and the notes that I refer to, the sources I refer to are in the show notes. I'm an academic. I always cite my sources. And I believe everybody should. I teach my students academic honesty, and I don't tolerate not giving credit to the original source. So those are in there. And also, they are there for you if you need to, if you'd like to learn more about the topic and read those articles. Okay, so um, I also included a couple of books that might be helpful for this topic, recommended recommended books. This is by no means a comprehensive list, okay? So what are some, some of the subtle signs of abuse? What are subtle signs of abuse? Well, there are different types of subtle abuse, and some of those are verbal abuse and ones that are more behaviors in the relationship. And then there are different types of behaviors in a relationship that can be considered subtle abuse. So these lists are pretty comprehensive, but they're not by any means the only ways that somebody may create an environment where subtle abuse is going on. So I'm going to explain the nature of it also so you can understand how this works. Not just what types they are, but how they work and how that makes your mind start to question, is this really happening? Am I over-exaggerating? Am I overthinking this? Is this genuine or am I imagining it? So let's look at some of the types of verbal abuse. Let's look at some of the subtle types of verbal abuse. Now there's an article here. This is from an article called Black, B-L-A-C, Black Detroit, Black Life, Arts, and Culture. And in this article, it says, what is verbal abuse? And it says, verbal abuse is extremely critical, threatening, or insulting words delivered in oral or written form and intended to demean, belittle, or frighten the recipient. And that's from the American Psychological Association that they're quoting. And then they go into a list. They talk a little bit about verbal abuse. And they go into a list. And I'm going to share this list with you. Ten signs of verbal abuse are withholding. And that's when the abuser refuses to listen or speak withholding emotional connection. Countering. The abuser may question your memory or deny any event took place, making you feel you're crazy or confused. That's also a form of gaslighting. And discounting is another one. That's number three. When an abuser trivializes your feelings or opinions, they discount or dismiss them as unimportant or silly. Gaslighting. Gaslighting happens when the abuser manipulates you to doubt your sanity or memories. They may tell you that the things that happen happen differently from what you remember. So keeping a record is sounds a little overdone, but if you can kind of make notes without obsessing, I don't want this to become something where you go down a rabbit hole. That's not healthy either. But, you know, covering your butt. Uh, we called it CYA at work, and you know what that means. Um, covering your butt is helpful because then you can keep your mind clear about what's really going on. Number five, blocking and diverting. It's common for an abuser to change the conversation or question topics that make them uncomfortable. So they change the subject. Accusing and blaming. A verbal abuser might point out flaws in you or others and blame you for their problems. Judging and criticizing. Abusers, abusers may undermine your self-esteem by making negative comments about your personality or behavior. Name-calling. The abuser may frequently use derogatory names or labels to define you, such as insulting your intelligence, character, or appearance. Demeaning and patronizing. An abuser may use demeaning or patronizing language to belittle or embarrass you. And then 10 is threatening. An abuser may make threats, either direct or indirect, by using coercive control or intimidation. So those are some of the forms of verbal abuse. I think some of those can also be more in the relationship, but those are a good list for verbal abuse. And you might hear my cat in the background. She isn't moving around every episode I've been recording lately. It's kind of funny. But back to the topic. I want to read a couple of lists because I want you to get a nice overview of the different types of behavioral and verbal abuse that can occur in a relationship. There is a source called Happiful, Happiful, H-A-P-P-I-F-U-L, Happiful, and it, there's an article here called Seven Subtle Signs of an Abusive Relationship, Seven Subtle Signs of an Abusive Relationship, and it's by Sarah Young, Sarah Young. And then it includes a list as well of behavioral 
But some of these are the same behavioral subtle forms of abuse. One is gaslighting. We've heard this term before. I've talked about it on other episodes. I've even dedicated almost whole episodes to gaslighting. So it's a term to describe when an abuser confuses their victim, making out that they are overly sensitive or overreacting. They might deny your version of events until you start to believe their narrative or claim an event never happened. They may present insults as jokes and make you feel ridiculous for getting upset. Gaslighting can be subtle and not that noticeable at first, but it steadily erodes the victim's self-esteem and leaves you emotionally reliant on the abusers. And then humiliation. Humiliation. Abusers may humiliate, undermine, or embarrass their victim in public or in private. They may call their partner names such as worthless, fat, stupid, and disgusting and use the vulnerabilities of their victims against them. This could be anything that the victim feels shame or guilt over, from secrets or private information the victim has shared to even mental illness they may have and are used to degrade the victim. Jealousy and isolation. As the relationship progresses, the abuser may become more jealous and possessive, voicing disapproval over who the victim talks to or spends time with, discouraging them from seeing friends and family, and accusing the victim of cheating. They will often often focus the jealousy on certain people and may fly into a fit of rage or frequently accuse the partner of cheating until the victim believes sustaining their relationships or interacting with this particular person is more trouble than it's worth. Now, keep in mind, that there's balance here. If somebody is hanging out with, in an intimate way, a person of the opposite sex, and they're married or they're in an intimate relationship with somebody else that is mutually exclusive, then maybe somebody has a right to be a little jealous. It also depends on how they handle it. And so look at all of these in context. And everybody has mind blocks where they forget that they said something. So it's not just about one behavior, but it's a pattern. Look for patterns of behavior. And those are the things to look out for when it comes to emotional abuse. One metaphor that I saw in a couple of articles, actually, it was funny because this metaphor was used twice at least in the five or six or seven articles that I read, was when you, if you put, now this is kind of, if you like animals, a little graphic, but it, if you put a frog in boiling water, the frog is going to jump out immediately, right? But if you put the frog in a nice cool pan of water and you heat it up really, really slowly, the frog's not going to notice. So that's kind of how, um, how this works with subtle abuse and with covert abuse. Covert means hidden. Um, covert narcissists are especially good at this, but a lot of different types of people do this. We've all been guilty of these strategies, by the way. It's how much do we do them? How much are we doing this? Another one is control. This is still in the Happiful article. Beyond your other relationships and interactions, An abusive partner may try to control what you wear, eat, and any other aspect of your life, checking your phone and social media, and maybe even go so far to demand your passwords. So those things may be used against you, things that are vulnerable like private information, sexuality, precarious immigration status, mental illness, and children, things that people find personal, private, vulnerable. Sometimes they can be used to control the victim by using threats of revealing their private information, outing a victim, reporting them to authorities, getting them sectioned, or taking the children away from them. Those are sick, but there are people that use those to um, control other people. Sexual abuse, so uh, disclaimer, this is about sexual abuse, just to let you know. Sexual abuse can include lots of things such as insisting you act out fantasies or engage in sexual acts that you have not given explicit or enthusiastic consent to, denial of your sexuality, not allowing you to use contraceptives, controlling when you get pregnant, or deliberately infecting you with an STD. Eeh, those are bad. But you get the idea. I won't go into detail about those. They speak for themselves. And then, of course, there are less recognized forms of physical abuse, such as denying a person the right to leave the house, sleep, eat, drink, or wash. And those do happen. It's sad, but sometimes those do happen in relationships as well. So not all physical abuse is hitting and kicking and punching and sexual abuse. Some of it is actually some of these more subtle forms that can be harder to pick up on from the outside, okay? 
So one last article on different behaviors that can show forms of subtle abuse or that can be subtle abuse. There's an article in a website called Toxic Ties, Toxic Ties. And this is a comprehensive article that really covers a lot of these very well. I'm not going to go over this in detail. I'm just going to list them just so you can get, like I said, a wide range of different types of behaviors that can be subtle abuse. So I won't go over any details of these, but I'll just include the list. This article, Toxic Ties, is called, Can You Recognize These 15 Subtle Signs of Emotional Abuse? And I'm not sure if there's a, an author here, but... Like I said, this is a long article, so this is a nice comprehensive one if you want to go into detail and learn more about more of these. Um, I don't see an author here, so Toxic Ties is the website, though. And the different types of subtle emotional abuse are being dismissive. Being di dismissive when your partner isn't listening or validating to your thoughts and feelings. Insulting nicknames like excuse some of this language, fatty, slut, idiot, stinky, muffin top, douchebag, lazy Susan, and so on. You get the idea. Some of them are worse. Spying and monitoring, so demanding to know where you are at all times. That's not the same thing as if your partner or your spouse is two hours late and they haven't texted you and you're like, hey, where are you at? So as always, there's balance here, right? Did you ever catch them spying on you via social media or digital devices? Number four, patronizing. Being treated in a patronizing way is when your partner talks down to you. A subtle form of emotional abuse, he or she is not calling you stupid, not directly, Directly, that they're acting in a way that makes you feel inferior or less intelligent. Pushing your buttons, provoking you an emotional reaction from you when they know something does that. Joking or sarcasm. Now, not all joking or sarcasm is abuse. Not all teasing is abuse. I know that some people even have affectionate name calling. And I have friends that will talk smack to each other, but we know each other. We trust each other. We know that it's not abuse. Like I've got a friend where we'll say, your face is ugly. Well, your face is uglier. And it's funny, you know, because we know it's not abuse. But when it's genuine or when it's subtle and you can't tell there's a boundary that starts to get blurred, that's when it's more abusive. Insulting and calling a, something a joke is one of the most recognizable forms of emotional abuse known as gaslighting. So just look at the context of the situation. Jealousy, as always, a little jealousy is okay. It's even healthy. It helps keep a marriage strong if it's a little bit, not too much, right? But when your partner acts like he or she owns you or always assumes the worst of you, it's emotional abuse. Tuning out, tuning out sabot sabotage is the very foundation of a healthy relationship in communication. It's when you're talking to your partner, but you feel like you're talking to a brick wall. So it can also be stonewalling. Keep in mind here, we all space out when somebody's talking. Sometimes we're human. Give people grace on that. But if they do it all the time, or if it's something that's really important to you and they're tuning you out, you need to call them on it kindly. Um, in, in the cases where it's safe to do that, of course. Interrupting. Interrupting is a terrible habit. And this person says, my personal pet peeve. If you s want to communicate that you don't care about your partner or what they have to say, and this isn't just partners, it's anybody in any relationship, go with interrupting. The message couldn't be any clearer. Again, when we get in a heated discussion or even just something we're really passionate about, it's possible we'll interrupt each other a little bit. And that's something where overlooking it to a point is good. But when it happens chronically and when it happens disrespectfully and when somebody's constantly talking over you, that's not okay. Being, quote, forgetful, again, it happens, but how much does it happen and in what context? Forgetfulness isn't necessarily abuse. Some people have a bad memory, pointing to myself. I can't even remember names, and I feel so bad because I feel like somebody may think that I don't care about them as a person, but I really have this gap in my mind where it, I can't remember names even when I try. So give people grace, but it's also a context thing as well. With our busy schedules, we all have, quote, senior moments when we completely forget something we're supposed to do. But when you're in a toxic relationship, the other person's forgetfulness is both intentional and self-serving, and it happens a lot, I'll add. Number 11, telling you how you feel. Some people just love, it says, telling you how you feel and how you should feel. 
If you don't think it's a big deal, think again. This is the same pattern of control evident in all other signs of emotional abuse, and it starts in childhood. For example, your parents constantly told you to shove your true feelings aside, or stop crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. I'm sure a lot of us heard that, right? So, number 12, the cold shoulder. The silent treatment is an obvious sign of emotional abuse. But what if someone is giving you the cold shoulder? What if your partner maintains contact but acts cold and distant whenever they're mad at you? That's a more subtle, passive-aggressive way to punish you, but it's still abuse. Especially if it happens a lot. We all get ticked off sometimes and we may do that for a little while. But if it goes on for a while or it's a chronic pattern again... Allow, allow people to be human, but look at the context of the situation. Keeping you in the dark. If your partner doesn't share what's going on with them and makes decisions without you, it's also emotional abuse. For example, if somebody makes large purchases without consulting you, and you're in a marriage or a relationship where you're financially mutually dependent, even if you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad and your spouse is the one that makes the money, they should be consulting you if they make any kind of large purchase more than a few hundred dollars, unless you've already talked about it. Number 14, never apologizing. One of the most ridiculous and harmful things you can do in a relationship is to assume the position, I'm always right. Have some humility. Apologize. Even if you feel like somebody might be oversensitive, just don't say, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not an apology. Just say, I'm sorry. And Tell them that you did not mean to make them feel that way. You see how that's different? Even if you don't agree, validating how they feel and then just saying, I'm sorry that I made you feel that way versus I'm sorry you feel that way. Just a little subtle difference can make all the difference if it's a sincere apology. Playing with the victim. Playing the victim. If your partner always makes excuses and acts in a way that invokes pity, they're playing the victim. And it's one of the clearest signs of emotional abuse. They're usually the perpetrator, but they're acting, trying to flip it and make it sound like you are. That's also called de DARVO. Deny, I forgot the full acronym. I actually did a full episode on that, but it's DARVO. And it's basically where you deny and then you somehow make the victim the perpetrator. Um, and so those are some of the signs of subtle emotional abuse in a relationship and subtle abuse in general in a relationship. So let's talk about why are subtle forms of abuse easy to miss? Why are they easy to miss? If they're so insidious, why is it that we don't see them when they're happening to us, when we're up close and personal, so to speak? So we're going to talk about that. And again, I'm going to read a little bit from some articles and add a little bit of my own ideas and some of my own experiences here, because I want you to really be able to hone in on this and be able to see it, okay? So there's an article here from a, an organization called BTSADV, BTSADV, and it's Break the Silence Against Domestic Violence, I think, .org. And this article is called Why is Emotional Abuse So Difficult to Recognize? And I have two articles here with the same title. So this is the one at BTSADV. And this is by Jen Rockefeller. And so I want to read a couple of paragraphs here. In a section called It's All Psychological, it says, this is the nature of why it remains hidden, why we don't see it even when we're experiencing it. It says, and because emotional abuse is a covert game that abusers play, all outsiders ever see is the abuser's calm demeanor and our mask of norm normalcy. Outsiders never see what goes on behind closed doors. Our reactions and the way we become unglued. Only when the abuser carefully plans for our reactions to be seen do outsiders see us come unglued. Then the abuser will turn and say, see what I have to deal with? Or they're crazy. I'm worried about them. So these are my ideas. So there are people that I think do this unconsciously. And then there, I think, are people that do this consciously. And the people that do it consciously are a lot worse. They're horrible human beings. And only God can heal them, unfortunately. And so, or fortunately, I guess, also. But because it says emotional abuse is a covert game that abusers play, 
So what they try to do is make themselves look good on the outside, and they'll usually be charismatic and courteous and kind, and everybody likes them, and then in private, they'll treat you like a complete piece of trash. And then on top of that, because other people see this positive behavior, they can't possibly believe that you're make that this stuff is happening to you and they'll think you're making it up or they'll have trouble believing it. And that just adds insult to injury and makes it a lot worse and makes you question if it's real. Because if literally everybody around you thinks that what's happening is not that big of a deal or that it's not happening or they question it or they think you're the one that's crazy, you're going to think it too. What are you going to do if there's nobody else that thinks this? It's a lonely and scary place to be and I know because I've been there. And then master manipulators, there's a section there and there's a paragraph that says, part of this mastery of manipulation is in the way the abusers portray themselves to the outside world. They project themselves to be the perfect mate or friend or family member or whatever who is always kind, loving, caring, and friendly. That's the main reason why outsiders find it so difficult to recognize that someone is being emotionally abused because the abuser appears, appears to be the most wonderful human being alive. Why at that point would an outsider believe you when you say you're being abused? Do you see why in the church that it's a perfect haven for narcissists, especially communal narcissists, which are people that try to use humanitarian and mission and human aid work and church work to make themselves look good. And then on the inside and with other people that they don't see, other people don't see they're being abusive and controlling. They actually use that image to prop themselves up so that when somebody comes forward about the abuse, people don't believe them. That's why it's so important when somebody comes forward with abuse and they seem sincere, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt. And the problem that I've seen in the church, <laughs> I'll get passionate about this, the problem I've seen in a lot of churches is that they defend the authoritarian person or they defend the institution and they invalidate the individual. And that's not what Christ taught. Christ taught us to love people, not institutions. I get that God wants us to be a body in Christ, but the people are what make up the church. So we should not be defending buildings and institutions. We should be defending people and their dignity and their agency and their autonomy and loving them. That's why it can be such a big deal in the church. And I'll come back to that in a little bit, but you can see I'm a very passionate about that topic because there's a lot of ways that religious communities can be a haven for narcissists and abusers, especially subtle forms of abuse. And unfortunately, more times than not, not always, but more times than not, they believe the perpetrator who's usually in a position of authority and power over the victim or the survivor, unfortunately. If you don't believe me, check out Mark Driscoll. If you follow or like Mark Driscoll, I'm sorry. He is a bad human being. Go watch The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Go listen to that podcast. It is powerful, and it'll show you a perfect example of how a narcissist uses their power in the church to gain power, invalidates victims while treating them like trash and abusing them and then leaves a wake of destruction in their path. And then when they're kicked out of the church or something's finally done, they just plant another church and start over and do it again, which is exactly what Mark Driscoll is doing. And then there are people like the transformed wife who are distorting scripture to an extreme there's nothing wrong with a wife staying home and having children and being a mother and not having a career I have no problem with that but the way she preaches it she tells women they should not vote they should not go to college and that they should not have basically whatever their husband wants or expects of them no matter how bad it is they should put up with it and tolerate it that is not foster growth in the husband and it also does not foster agency and love towards the wife or the mother. So that's something that, one reason I believe that religious communities can be a haven that is ripe with abuse. Are all traditional churches full of abuse? No, of course not. There's a lot of traditional churches that are loving and kind, and they listen to their members, but that's unfortunately not always the case. That's not always the case. Cats still jumping around out there. So the Good Therapy article 
is, like I said, that's a website I've used before. It says, why is emotional abuse so difficult to recognize? So this is a different article than the other one, but it's from a different source. So this one is, why is emotional abuse so difficult to recognize? And this is by, it just says a good therapy topic expert. It doesn't include anything else about this author. Oh, here, here she is. Her name is Betsy Smith, M-E-D-L-P-C-S. So Betsy Smith wrote this article. And I just wanted to read a couple of paragraphs from it. One, this is also about the nature of hidden abuse and why sometimes subtle abuse is hard to see, even when you're experiencing it. It says, people who are emotionally abusive can be expert manipulators. They may be very intentional about choosing behaviors that cannot be proven or that come close to crossing lines while retaining deniability. They may manufacture or maintain a chaotic environment so that it is hard to pin down or describe exactly what is happening. They may also lie about what has happened or re rewrite history in order to re avoid responsibility for their actions. And then a couple of paragraphs down, it says, perhaps the most perplexing phenomenon of all is the ability of abusive individuals to be remarkably kind, caring, and generous at times. Few people would remain in relationships that always felt bad. Fewer would choose to begin relationships with people who treated them poorly all the time. The confusing fact of the matter is individuals who are capable of cruelty are also capable of kindness. They may be charming and generous at times. These instances of kindness and generosity may be good, but abuse is never okay. It cannot be offset. So I want to make a point here. If you're with somebody who's overwhelmingly kind and generous and then they treat you like trash consistently a good bit of the time and it confuses the hell out of you that is an abusive relationship and they're reinforcing the positivity to keep you in the relationship and confuse you the bad the good does not cancel out the bad when it's to that degree i'll say it again the good does not cancel out the bad when it's to that degree again we're all flawed we have complex relationships. I get that there's a gray area there and that, that that's complicated. But when you are completely confused and you don't understand what's going on and you don't know if you're being abused and you are just up and down and up and down all the time, you're being abused. And the good does not outweigh the bad. That does not excuse all the bad things they do or forgive it or just let that go. I'm not saying don't forgive. I'm saying that it doesn't cancel it out. Does that make sense? It does not cancel it out. So I know I'm reading from a lot of articles, so bear with me. Thank you so much for listening because it, these are putting in words what you need to know about this, and this is so important to understand, and that's why I'm going in so much depth here. So bear with me. But there's another article here in a website called Confusion to Clarity, and it's a blog by a Christian woman, Confusion to Clarity. And this article's really good. It's pretty comprehensive. Why are you so confused by covert abuse? The doubt-filled mind in dysregulated brain. That's the, type, the article title. And it's written by a woman named Helena Knowlton. Helena Knowlton. So in this article, there's a list of statements and responses that she includes that could be considered subtle forms of abuse. And then I'm going to read those so you can see concrete examples of the subtle forms of abuse that we've already identified so you can understand the nature of this a little bit better. So some of those are... You, that you might question yourself. And she's talking about this from the perspective of a man abusing a woman. And yes, women can abuse men just as much as men can abuse women. Women can abuse women and men can abuse men and so on. Anybody can be a victim or a perpetrator. And keep in mind that people who are abusers can also be abused. I do not condone that either. But here's a list of how you or someone like you may question yourself if you're in a situation like this and you're so confused and you're like, is this going on? What is wrong with me? And you're like, is he really abusing me? Is it really that bad? Am I overreacting? What if it's me? What if I'm the toxic person? Should I leave? 
What if I'm wrong? Does he know what he's doing? What if he can't help it? Maybe he doesn't mean it. He's being nice. Is it real this time? And then she says in response, yes, he is really abusing you. It is really that bad. No, you're not overreacting. It's not you. You're not the toxic person. You aren't wrong. Yes, he knows what he's doing. He can help it. Yes, he does mean it. He's being nice just to love bomb you. And so these are, and so these questions are symptoms of being abused and every victim wonders the same thing. So that is to validate your experience that you are not doubting it. It is as bad as you think it is. If it's affecting you, then it's affecting you. If you have major questions, then trust and listen to those things. It's painful when you start to realize that, and it's empowering at the same time. It's overwhelming in so many ways because when it comes to light, and this is what happened to me. I, I found a book called Healing from Hidden Abuse, and I had some extra Audible credits or something, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get this book. Why the heck not? I started listening to it and alarm bells went off. For some reason, I had been working on myself and doing healing work for years, but nothing ever made me realize I was abused. I even questioned if I was. And I was told, no, um, you were born that way. There's something wrong with you. If you've got depression and anxiety, yeah, that's genetic and that's it. It's not something that happened to you. It's not your environment. It's not how you were treated. It's not that you were emotionally neglected or abused. And this is not to blame anybody or to hate anybody or anything like that. I'm not calling any names. But that's what happened to me. And when I realized what had happened to me, alarm bells started going off. And I would just sit there. Keep in mind, you don't want to go down a rabbit hole. But I would just sit there and say, yes, this really happened. No, you're not imagining it. Yes, this is valid and real. Yes, this did impact you as much as you think it did. And I would say it over and over and over for a while. I didn't keep doing it. But to validate that that was happening, to stop letting it continue to slip back into my unconscious mind and to doubt it. I had to bring that stuff up to the surface. And even the Bible says the truth will come to the light. And so I had to clear the air and that completely changed everything for me. That's when I really started to heal was when I did not deny anymore what had happened to me. And I did not deny it on purpose. I didn't understand. I had been brainwashed, even if it wasn't intentional brainwashing. I had been brainwashed my whole life to believe there's nothing wrong with what happened to you. There's something wrong with you. Let me tell you this. I say this all the time in the podcast. You are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you. There is nothing wrong with you. You were not born defective. There are people I understand that are on the spectrum that's not a defect. That's just how they are. There are people who have more of a propensity towards mental illness, such as bipolar disorder, eating disorders, anxiety, depression, ADHD, and so on. Those do not mean that you are defective or you were born that way. You may have a genetic predisposition to them that might have been aggravated by environmental factors that are not your fault. And just because you have some of these doesn't mean this is happening to you. But if this is happening to you, there's a good chance that you have some of these. You see what I'm saying? So it's not your fault. And I'm trying to bring what is in the darkness to the light and validate it. So that you understand the nature of it and the insidious hidden nature of it. And how that's why it stays hidden for so long. I was almost 40 years old when I realized what had happened to me. And I spent hours working on myself. I prayed. I meditated. I read my Bible. I did self-help work. I read books. I took courses. And I still didn't see it. And one day God showed me. Well, I guess when I was ready. I don't know why it took so long. But that book unlodged that from me and allowed me to begin to release it and heal it. And my whole life changed after that. And I am so thankful to God for my smoking gun, so to speak. Because believe me, you have one too and it's there. So believe it. Okay? And so there's a lot of different articles here about the nature of brainwashing. And like I said, I don't mean this to sound like somebody is just hideously evil. It's not, that's not always the case. But in some cases, it is the case. Um, so Continuing in this article, I want to read the definition of brainwashing in confusion to clarity. So let me read that to you to give you a little bit more 
context here. So I'm going to start a little higher up. It says covert abuse changes our perceptions so deeply that we can't clearly see what is going on and we are unable to live in truth. We have literally been brainwashed by the abuser. This is why I hear women say, his therapist told me he knows exactly what he's doing, but I just can't see it. Brainwashing is the activity of forcing somebody to accept your ideas or beliefs, for example, by repeating the same thing many times or by preventing the person from thinking clearly. That's in the Oxford Dictionary. I'll say it again. Brainwashing is is the activity of forcing somebody to accept your ideas or beliefs. For example, by repeating the same thing many times or by preventing the person from thinking clearly. So it's not always somebody yelling and screaming at you. No, it's not how it happened. But like when I questioned it and I was told that, that is how that happened. And maybe that person even believed it themselves. But that's not what actually happened. And it says, our reality has been changed to the reality the abuser creates. This is why when we begin to see the abuse, we switch back and forth between believing it and not believing it. Every covert abuse victim goes through this because of brainwashing. So that, my friend, is a smoking gun. And then there's a section here continuing in this article. I love this blog here. This is great. But she talks about, I used to live in agony, and I want to show somebody's experience so you see how this works. I shared mine with you a little bit. I want to read this one as well, just real quickly. Thank you. Like I said, I know this is a long one, but this is one that we need to go in depth and we need to talk about it. Emotional neglect and covert abuse are not talked about enough. Gee, I wonder why. That's the whole point. You don't talk about them. They're covert, right? So she says, I was living in an internal hell of confusion and self-doubt. Around and round I would go, is it me? Is it him? He says it's me and he's very convincing, but why am I so afraid? And if it's me, what else can I do? It's abuse. It's not abuse. He can't really mean to be doing this. While going through this long, painful process of recognizing that I was being covertly abused, I'd write in my journal that it was true that I was being abused. Then I'd get confused, start to doubt it, and read what I had written, and it sounded like nonsense to me. I couldn't figure out if I had been deceived when I wrote it, or I was deceived right then in not believing it. And always, in the back of my mind, there was the terrifying fear that I was losing my mind because one way or the other, I wasn't seeing the world the way it was. And this happening long after I was no longer with him. So it continued. It took some time, she says. She says, even my counselor, who specializes in trauma and abuse, has since told me she was amazed at how, even after the divorce, I would come into a session all confused about whether he really was a covert abuser sort it through with her mind and get to the truth, walk out feeling strong and repeat the same process over and over, week after week, month after month. I had no me, no core, no center. She said, this is the depth of what abusers steal from us, our very own reality, our ability to trust and maintain our perceptions and to think clearly. And that is why I do not condone scriptural interpretations that take agency away from anybody, including women. Because people have a core identity for a reason. And if it gets to the point where you're just completely revolved around somebody else and you're not an individual yourself, that is abuse. Period. So every woman, she says, who has been in a long-term abusive relationship has lost the ability to think for herself. She has lost contact with the voice of her own instincts, with her own inner world, and can no longer give it a voice. And that's by Don Hennessy and... This um, lady that wrote this article, she uses his resource a lot. He's got a book about this, and I'll put it in the show notes, that it's basically about covert abuse of men towards women. So it is very specific, and like I said, I know women can do this to men just as much, so please don't think that I'm saying it only happens one way. It doesn't. I know it can happen in any dynamic, and that is true. So if you're a man and you've been abused by a woman in this way, your experiences are just as valid and you have just as much right to be validated and to express how you feel and to get to the bottom of it and find healing. And we need more men to come forward and to help do things like I'm doing. 
there's not a lot of survivor men that come forward and do this work to help other men and other people in general. And that's why while there are platforms that are exclusively for women, and I believe in those, and I think there should be a safe space that is only for women, I also uh, welcome men into my group because there's not enough havens for men. And I think everybody deserves healing regardless of who you are. So if you're a man and you've been told to suck it up and stop complaining and don't be weak and all that, that is a load of crap. And you deserve to find healing and you need to express those feelings and you need to let that stuff out in a healthy and safe environment. And it is okay to be human. It's okay to have feelings and it's okay to seek the healing that you deserve even if you're a man. And especially if you're a man, you deserve healing regardless of who you are. Period. So that is why are subtle forms of abuse easy to miss. So very briefly, we've already talked about this some, but how misinformation in the church and in religious communities can often make this worse and keep people brainwashed and in abusive situations. And I'll just read one passage and then move on to some of the last sections of the podcast. So this is also in the same article, and it's a section called The Woman of Faith's Battle. Okay, the woman of faith's battle. So why are Christian women especially vulnerable to this? You see how men and women can be vulnerable in different ways? Men are taught not to have feelings. They're taught to be strong. They're taught that they're not, they can't be abused. A woman can abuse a man. Bull hockey, yeah, they can. Okay, so, and if you're a woman and you're taught to submit to your husband to the degree that you're not allowed to have your own life, and your own choices, and autonomy, and agency, and dignity, and get an education, and have choices, then that is a problem, and that state takes you straight into a potential abuse pattern. So this says, the woman of faith's battle, and it says, for women of faith, the brainwashing is all around us. The church is also teaching us to believe the lies, and it says that a wife, that as a wife, it's your job to support and not contradict his views, that he is the head of the household, that you should trust him implicitly, that you need to submit to his ways and beliefs, that you need to let him lead, that you need to try harder, that, quote, it takes two, that it's his place to give you feedback about your sin because iron sharpens iron. Not one of these statements comes from an understanding of abuse, and they are all dangerous to the mind of a woman who's being abused. So I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't listen to your husband. You should if he is not abusing you. That's different. I'm not saying that you shouldn't listen to him if he's trying to show you something that you might need to work on if he's a good man. You should listen if he's a good man. If he's an abuser, he's not doing it because he loves you. He's going to say that, but he's doing it because he's an abuser and that's how he is. He wants to mess with you and he wants to control you. So I'm not making an overall statement about all of these things here, but what I am saying is that these can be a situation that can be fertile soil for abuse, so just be careful. That's I'll leave it with that, okay? And this is coming from, like I said, this is a Christian-based, Confusion to Clarity is the podcast, not the podcast, the, um, the website and the blog, okay? So that's a little bit about why you're so confused about this kind of abuse and what happens. How do you detect subtle forms and types of emotional abuse? So how can we detect those without lapsing into forgetfulness of these types of abuse? You have a lot of, I have a lot of insight to share from my own experiences and I've already shared that a little bit. So I won't go into that again, but there are a lot of ways that you can detect these forms of abuse. And so I'm kind of combining what are ways we can heal from these unique types and manifestations of abuse with how can we detect them because I think those go hand in hand. There's a Healthline article called Emotionally Abusive Relationships Can Be Hard to Recognize. Here's Why. This is a really good article that talks about this and it does talk about unearthing it and seeing it for what it is. And this article is by Simone Marie and it's called Emotionally Abusive Relationships Can Be Hard to Recognize. Here's Why, and it's in Healthline. There's a section so called, So What Should You Do? 
So what should you do? So once you realize this is happening and you identify it and you realize the extent of it, what do you do about it? That's a very good question. I've talked about that a little bit. Let, let me read this section here because it gives a really good overview of what you should do. So what should you do if you're thinking you're being emotionally abused? First, remember that you didn't do anything wrong. Let me say that again. You did not do anything to deserve this. It's not your fault that someone is mistreating you. It's never your fault. Nobody deserves to be insulted, berated, shamed, or abused. Next, it says it's okay if you aren't ready to leave immediately, but ask yourself why you aren't. So, in terms of leaving a marriage, if it's that bad, yes, you should leave. I'm not going to tell you whether you should or not if it's kind of a gray area, but if it's that bad, you, you see what I'm saying? It says sometimes the idea of leaving is overwhelming that it prevents victims of emotional abuse from actually reaching out for help. Know that no one is going to make you do something you don't want to do. It's ultimately your choice. If you're not ready to leave, explore that, says Crawford. What is keeping you there? Are you there resources that you can help or replace the part of the relationship you think or feel you cannot live without? It can also be helpful to sit down and make a list of pros and cons about staying in the relationship. Most of the times, the cons have more weight, says Selin. If that's the case, it's good indication you might want to end the relationship for your mental health. Seeing it all written out can help that sink in. And then there's other, it, it continues, therapy could help you prepare to leave. So if it's a really bad relationship, you should end it. Whether that's going no contact, whether that's leaving, whether that's cutting off the person, or whatever the case may be. But therapy is the next step. And then it talks about reaching out for support and then treatment after you leave the relationship. So it says being able to sit with, process, and understand your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors is a healing experience, says Crawford. This is a quote that the author is using, Simone Scully, the writer. Therapy helps with perspective and uncovering things we do not know or choose to avoid about ourselves. There are also coaches like Blake who are trauma-informed. They, too, can help you grieve past traumas and leave to self-forgive. So that is some things you can do if you're in this situation. So the Toxic Ties article, come. we're getting close to the end here. Thank you for um, going with me on this journey. So the Toxic Ties article also talks about this. And it talks about what should you do. Once you know this is going on, what do you do about it? And so here it says, if you're seeing signs of subtle emotional abuse in a relationship, it's time to reevaluate and redefine your boundaries and priorities. Relationships are usually complicated and all of us from time to time exhibit unhealthy behaviors. An honest and vulnerable conversation should be enough to address the issue and move forward as a stronger and happier couple or a stronger and happier friendship or family. If it's somebody you feel like you can reason with, but if it's not, don't. That can be difficult to decipher, but if you don't think you can reason with them, then don't. But if it's somebody that maybe they've gotten off track, they're going through something, it might be good to try to have a conversation about it. And then it says, but if your partner or whoever regularly does most of the items on the list, one conversation probably won't change anything. That's harsh, but it's true. Let me say it again. If they regularly do most of the items on these lists, one conversation is probably not going to change anything. Or they'll change for a little while and then go back to the behavior. And that's even worse. They're comfortable with their role as the controller behind the scenes. So consider what you're getting out of the relationship and what you're putting in. Think about what this does to you. What is the cost of staying in this relationship? And keep in mind that talking or arguing with an emotionally abusive person will not solve the problem because they're convinced they're always right. It's hard to spot. Um, it's a hard spot to be in because you may love them deeply and still hope that they can change. Here's the truth. You can love a person and still let them go. I'll say it again. You can love somebody and still let them go. How many of us have had to love people from afar because of this? It's sad. It breaks our heart. But that's what happens sometimes if it's irretrievable, if they're that toxic, if they're that abusive. And then it says they can love you and still treat you poorly. I don't know about that. I don't know if I agree that that's love. But it says it's up to you to decide how you deserve to be treated and how much you're willing to excuse in the name of love. So if it's that bad, do not put up with that crap. Do not put up with it.
okay? Set hard boundaries at the very least. And you may have to end the relationship. And like I said, if it's a gray area, try to have a conversation with somebody if you think you can reason with them, but only if you feel safe doing so. And go in with the expectation that it may or may not go how you want. And if it doesn't, you have to accept that. That sucks, but you have to accept that. And then the need to be believed is also important because validation is the key here to everything. Validation, I'll say it again, validation is the key to everything. In the BTSADV, that's a lot of letters, article, Breaking the Silence Against Domestic Violence, it says emotional abuse leaves no visible scars. So when we say we are being abused, it's hard to prove. That's why it's so vital for outsiders to believe us. So to the loved ones of victims and survivors, please believe your loved one when they say they are being abused. And I'll say it, especially if they don't seem to be one that is prone to making stuff up. But please believe them. And being believed goes a long way towards a survivor finding their voice again. That is absolutely vital is validation, self-validation, validation from a therapist or a coach, a licensed professional, validation from safe others that you can talk to about this that won't go rat out to the other person, and so forth and so on. So that is absolutely imperative. And then to close all of this off, ways we can heal. In the Confusion to Clarity article, which I think is probably the best one here on this, it talks about there is hope. Here are some things you can do, concrete actions you can take to work on healing this. The first step to healing is to continually expose yourself to the truth that you are being covertly abused. That's why I would say, this is happening. This is real. I'm not imagining this. And I would say it over and over and over. Like I said, it's not to create a feedback loop and go down a rabbit hole and obsess. It's to validate that this happened and that this was real. And then to learn the tactics and to understand why you experience such confusion and self-doubt. That's why I'm doing this podcast. It says, for, so for some women or people, I would say, this is enough over time to counter the confusion. But many of the techniques to calm down PTSD symptoms will also regulate the brain with repeated use over time. And some women find the need to be guided with help to overcome the brainwashing and brain dysregulation by working with a counselor or coach who specializes in trauma and covert abuse. So I've actually thought about becoming a licensed coach. I just sometimes, I don't have the resources or the time or the support right now, but I, I feel like that's something I want to do. I don't have a lot of emotional energy to work with people, but I would love to do it a few hours a week. Thank you so much for listening to this. Um, I know that it was long, and I know I sound like a frog right now, and I apologize but so we covered a lot. So we covered a lot in this podcast. We identified subtle forms and types of abuse. What are some of the subtle signs of abuse? Why are subtle forms of abuse easy to miss? How is misinformation in the church and religious communities? How can that be make things worse in some cases? How can we detect subtle forms and types of emotional abuse? And what are ways we can heal these unique types of abuse? So I hope this has been helpful. Remember, you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you. And don't let anybody take that away from you. And if they are, take it back. Okay? Take it back. So if God called us to love all 8 billion other people in the world or whatever it is, then 8 billion people are called to love you. That means something. An agency and autonomy are not things that God ever intended for people to lose or to be taken away from them under any circumstances. So... You need to get out of a situation if it's that bad. And if it's a gray area, you need to pray about it. You need to do the healing work. You need to, if it's logical, talk to the person. You need to get help. And in most cases, I think you need to talk to a therapist or a counselor or a licensed professional because they can help you untangle this mess and look at it objectively. So thank you so much for listening. Check out the podcast. Check out the YouTube channel. Um, Patreon and Ko-Fi are where you can support me. And you can also go to the Facebook group and the um, other websites. Thank you so much. Have a great day. God bless you. And remember, beloveds, God loves you. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Christian Emotional Recovery. 
hosted by Rachel Leroy. For links to this week's resources and to join the discussion, check out this episode's show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com, where you can also find links to our YouTube channel and Facebook group. Join our email list and get other episodes and resources. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review the podcast and tell a friend who may benefit from this message. See you next time. And remember, beloveds, God loves you and you are fearfully and wonderfully made.